OpenGL relies heavily on a state-based architecture. If this wasn't the case, then every draw call would have had many dozens of parameters. In addition to the existing mode, starting index and number of indices to render, we would also need to specify the shader program, the uniform variables, the buffers, the textures and their parameters, and potentially many other bits of information. All of these are required even for the most basic rendering. For this reason, OpenGL is constructed as a giant state machine, where all of the above are set, or bound in OpenGL terms, and when the draw call is issued, the current state of the machine is used to provide all the required information. Now, this in itself is okay, but the problem is that in most cases, if you want to make changes to an object such as a buffer or a texture, you first need to bind it to the state machine before you can make any changes to it. For example, if you want to load vertices into a vertex buffer, you have to bind it to the GL array buffer binding point, and then you can call gel buffer data to do the actual update. It seems odd, but this is how it works. The problem here, of course, is that you need to be very careful when updating objects and clean up after yourselves and keep the state correct for the following draw call. This problem has already been addressed for quite a while in OpenGL version 4.5 from 2014. The solution is called Direct State Access, or DSA. This simply means that you can now modify objects directly without binding them first to the OpenGL state. This keeps the state machine clean and there's less chance that you will make unintended changes to it. Okay, before we jump into the implementation, I'd like to say a big thank you to Yuhao Han and Peter Jacob who recently joined the OpenGL underground. If you too would like to support this channel, you can do that at patreon.com slash OGLDev or by joining the YouTube channel as a member. Okay, so I'm going to start with the textures and then we'll move on to buffers and finally uh, frame buffers. Now you basically have two options. You can either switch your code entirely to DSA and this is okay if you know that the target platform uh, will have OpenGL version 4.5 or above but I decided to maintain backward compatibility for the sake of older platforms and also to keep the code correct and matching for my older or original tutorials that were not DSA. So we are now in the texture class and this function load internal used to take care of everything regarding the internal OpenGL state. Now you can see that we check whether the OpenGL version is higher, actually higher or equal to uh, 4.5. And if this is the case, we go to load internal DSA. And if not, we go to load internal non-DSA. So this is the original code, the non-DSA code. And you can see that we use, you know, GL gen textures, GL bind textures. You will see in a second that we have new functions for that. And you should be familiar uh, with everything that, uh, that goes on here. Now let's split the view vertically so we can compare the code side by side. So we have the non-DSA version here and the new DSA version on the left hand side. We start by creating a handle for the texture. So instead of calling gen textures, we call uh, create textures. And this function takes three parameters compared to just two uh, the pre in the previous version. So the first parameter is the texture target which can be uh, GL texture 2D or 1D or 3D. In this class, I'm just supporting um, 2D, but this function can handle the other cases as well. The second parameter is the number of handles or textures handles that you want to create. And the last parameter is the address where you want to receive the result, uh, which can be an array. If you have more than one handles that you want to create in a single function call, but in this case, I just create a single handle. So we have a GLU int here, or the address, actually the address of a GLU int. So without direct state access, you have to bind the texture handle to the state by calling GL bind texture in order to make changes to it. Which brings us to the problem that we have discussed. Now you can create the texture for the specific target and you don't make any changes to the state. 
Next, we need to allocate storage for the texture and also load the texture data, which we got right here, into the texture. So in this case, we actually have two functions to replace a single function without DSA. Previously, we would work on this target and the system would know that we are referring to this object. Now, both of these functions take the handle as the first parameter. So Jill Texture Storage 2D allocates the required space for this texture. It takes the number of MIP map levels, the internal format, the width and the height of the image. For the MIP map levels, I decided to go with the minimum between 5 and the base to log of the maximum between the image width and the image height. But this is not critical, you can choose the number of levels. Just make sure that it is not zero, otherwise it will be an error. The format is selected in a switch statement uh, based on the number of bytes per pixel, but this is the same as the non-DSA version. Okay, so there's no change here. So now we have the storage and we need to load the image to it, which we received here. So we call Jill Texture subimage 2D. Again, we have the handle as the first parameter. Then we have the target mipmap level, which is zero, because we're going to create all, all the mipmap levels using generate texture mipmap later on. And then we have the X offset and the Y offset. And we have zero for both because we're covering the entire texture. Then again, the width and height of the image followed by the format, the data type, and the image itself. And again, the format depends on the bytes per pixel. Next, we need to set the texture parameters. So instead of the old Jill text parameter I or F or whatever, we have Jill texture parameter I or F or whatever. Okay, texture instead of text. And the function parameters are almost the same, except that instead of specifying the texture target, where you have the texture handle handle bound, you now specify the texture handle directly. So again, the state is not changed. Everything else is the same. As you can see right here, we have the same parameters. Next, if you want the system to generate the texture MIP maps for you, you need to call Jill generate texture MIP map instead of Jill generate MIP map. And again, this one takes the target, this one takes the handle. And finally, in the non-DSA version, it's always recommended to keep the state clean by binding texture zero, texture handle zero, to the same texture target, which will effectively disconnect the current texture from the state. In the DSA version, we don't need to do that because we haven't made any changes to the state. Now, when the time comes to use the texture for sampling, so for example, from a fragment shader, we have a bind function, which takes the texture unit where you want to bind this texture. And again, we need to select the proper uh, path here, the DSA or the non-DSA. So in the non-DSA version, we have to activate this texture unit and then bind the handle to the texture target on that unit. And this is how it works. Now we have a new function called GL bind texture unit which takes the index of the texture unit. And you need to be careful because the texture unit is not an index, it is actually some macro. For example, for texture zero, we have 84C0 in hex. Okay, so to make this an index, we need to subtract the first one, geo texture zero, from the provided texture unit. Okay, as you can see, all the texture units are consecutive. So you can simply subtract the first one from whatever, and then you will get uh, 15 in this case. So this is the first parameter, the index of the texture unit, and then we have the handle of the texture in the second parameter. Now there are additional functions for handling textures in the DSA way, but this is the basic stuff that you need to know. Moving on to buffers, and for that I'm going to use my basic mesh class to demonstrate this. I'm using this class to load meshes and models from files uh, using the SMP library, but here we're going to focus only on the management of OpenGL stuff. 
So in the non-DSA version, we call gel gen vertex arrays to create the handle for the VAO, one handle in this case, but you can create an array here. Then we call gel bind vertex array on the handle, and this makes it part of the state. And finally, we call gel gen buffers to create the array of buffers that we need uh, for the vertex and index buffers. In the DSA version, we replace these three calls with these two new functions. GL create vertex array with the same signature to create the handle for the VAO and GL create buffers instead of gen buffers, which does the same thing for the buffers. As you can see, there is no binding of the VAO here, so we are not changing the state uh, at this point. Notice that before this function returns, we disconnect the VAO from the state by calling GL bind vertex array uh, on the zero handle. This prevents it from being unintentionally changed later on. Now let's go down to the populate buffers function, which actually loads the vertices and indices into their respective buffers. So we have the DSA version and the non-DSA version, and let's put them side by side. So in the non-DSA version, we first need to bind the vertex buffer handle to the GL array buffer binding point, and the index buffer goes to the GL element array buffer. So they are now part of the state, and now we can call GL buffer data in order to actually load the vertices and the indices into these binding points where we know that these buffers are connected. In the DSA version, we have a new function called GL named buffer storage, which has almost the same signature as GL buffer data, but instead of using the binding point, we have the actual handle as the target, the vertex and the index buffer, and then the rest of the function is the same. We have the number of bytes that we want to load into the buffer and the source address of the actual data. The last parameter is a flag where we can provide hints to the system to indicate, for example, that this is dynamic data, which will be changed later on, and a bunch of different options. So the vertex and index buffers are now fully populated with data, but we need to connect them to the VAO. In the non-DSA version, this is done implicitly when we call GL bind buffer, because we know that the VAO is already bound. So when we do this, this buffer, the vertex buffer, is connected as an array buffer to the VAO. Uh, same for the index buffer. In the DSA version, this is more explicit, and we have a new function called GL vertex array vertex buffer. The first three parameters to this function are the VAO, uh, a binding point, and the handle for the buffer. So in this case, we have the vertex buffer connected to binding point zero in the VAO. And the binding point allows us to connect several buffers to the same VAO, a different binding point, and then we can stream data, different attributes from different buffers. And this we will see in a second right here below. If you remember in my SIMP tutorial, I talk about uh, AOS versus SOA, array of structures versus structure of arrays. And in the SOA case, we maintain a different buffer for each of the three uh, attributes, in this case, position, texture coordinates, and normals. So if you want to implement SOA, you would create one vertex buffer for each element type and then connect each buffer to a different index or a different binding point. But in this case, we are using AOS, so we have a single vertex buffer at binding point zero. Next, we have the offset of the first element in the buffer, and we start at the beginning, so we have offset zero. And the final parameter is the stride between two consecutive vertices, or the size of a single vertex, and this tells the system how to interpret this buffer, where each vertex begins. And we have a structure called vertex with the three attributes, so we take the size of it, and this is our stride. For the index buffer, we have GL vertex array element buffer, which is simpler. It just takes the VAO and the handle of the index buffer. And now the vertex and index buffers are connected to the VAO. Next, we need to specify the layout. 
So previously we would enable each vertex attribute. These are macros. We have the position at zero, texture coordinates at one and normals at two. And they match the location in the vertex shader. And for each attribute, we also need to call Jill vertex a tree pointer with the index of the attribute and uh, the number of elements and the type of the elements. Okay, so for example, vec3 here, vec2 here, whether this is normalized and uh, et cetera, et cetera. You should be familiar with this function. Now in the DSA version, we have Jill enable vertex array a trib instead of a trib array. Okay, a trib array here, array a trib here. It's a bit confusing. This one takes the VAO in addition to the index of the attribute instead of just the attribute because this one works on the bound VAO. Next, we have Jill vertex array a trib format instead of vertex a tree pointer, but it is also almost the same. It takes the VO, the index of the attribute, the number of elements and their type, the normalized Boolean flag, and the offset to this attribute from the start of the vertex. So I have the number of floats here, which starts at zero, and then I increment it by three after the position, and I increment it by two after the texture coordinates, and then the offset for each attribute is the number of floats times the size of a float. So we have enabled the vertex attribute, and we specify the format, but we still need to tell the system which vertex buffer we are referring to. So for that, we have jill vertex array a trib binding, which takes the VAO, the index of the attribute, and the binding point. And now the vertex buffer on this binding point is associated with this attribute. So in our case, this is zero because we have a single vertex buffer. And that's it for buffers. The final topic for today is the frame buffer. And I think that the shadow map class is a good example to see that. So in the non-DSA version, we use GL gen frame buffers. And in the DSA version, we have create frame buffers. Okay, so it's the same signature, very similar to what we saw before. Now that we have the handle for the frame buffer, we need to create the depth buffer, which is a texture. In this function, we have depth component as the format and depth component as the internal format and the type, the data type is float. Now, since this is a shadow map, we're not loading any data into it initially. So we have null as the last parameter. In the DSA version, we have a new function, gl create textures, which takes the target texture 2D as the first parameter. And then we have the number of handles and the address of the result. Now, instead of gl text image 2D, we have gl texture storage 2D, which takes the handle of the shadow map, the number of the MIP map levels, which is one in this case, we're not generating MIP maps for the shadow map. And then instead of depth component, I've used uh, depth component uh, 32. For some reason, depth component gives me an invalid enum error. And then we have the width and the height of the shadow map. Next, we need to set a few texture parameters for the shadow map. So same as before, we will use Jill texture parameter I instead of text parameter I. And then we have the handle of the shadow map instead of just the binding point, but the rest is exactly the same. And now we have the frame buffer and the shadow map. So we need to connect the shadow map to the frame buffer. So in the non-DSA version, what we need to do is to bind the frame buffer to the frame buffer uh, binding point and then call frame buffer texture 2D to connect to bind the shadow map to the frame buffer. Okay, so we are binding here the shadow map to the depth attachment. And this is a texture 2D on the frame buffer, which is bound to this binding point. Again, our handle. So instead of all this mess, we now have GL named frame buffer texture, which takes the handle of the frame buffer the attachment point, depth attachment in this case, of course, um, the handle of the shadow map and the uh, 
meet map level, which is uh, zero. It's the same as uh, this one here. We have a single meet map in this texture. Now, when we use this frame buffer, we want to disable access, read write access to the color buffer. So previously we would call a GL draw buffer and read buffer and pass GL none so that there is no uh, read or write to the color buffer. Instead of that, we have GL named frame buffer, read buffer and draw buffer, which is very similar, takes the handle and none again. And finally, it's highly recommended to check that the frame buffer was created successfully. So in the non-DSA version, we have GL check frame buffer status, and you need to provide a binding point frame buffer, then you get the status, and then you can check it for completeness and do something about it if there is a problem. In the DSA version, we have GL check named frame buffer status. Very similar, just takes the handle of the specific frame buffer. So all of this was done without changing any state uh, on the system. In this case, since we've bound the frame buffer here, we also need to disconnect it and bind the default frame buffer back. Now to actually use the shadow map, as you know, we have a shadow pass and then a lighting pass. So we render into the shadow map during the shadow pass, and then we read from it during the lighting pass. So we have bind for writing, for the shadow pass and bind for reading for the lighting pass. So in the case of writing, uh, there is no change. Actually, we bind the frame buffer to the draw frame buffer target, and we set the viewport to match the size of the frame buffer or the shadow map. There is a change, however, uh, in the lighting pass when we want to read from the shadow map. So we have bind for reading DSA and bind for reading non-DSA. And this is the regular one. As usual, we need to activate uh, the texture unit and then bind the texture, the shadow map, to the GL texture 2D target. In the DSA version, as we saw earlier, we have GL bind texture unit. So no need to activate the texture unit, but need to be careful to provide an index here. Okay, so need to subtract GL texture 0 from the texture unit, the provided parameter, and the shadow map handle. And this is it for today. So I hope you found this video helpful. And uh, please let me know in the comments whether you're already using DSA or you plan to use it and how it is working for you. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you on the next tutorial.